Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another VES Artex Academy webinar. Today, we're talking to Dr. Paul Fricke from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we're talking about optimizing use of sex semen in dairy herds. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Fricke in a second. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can ask them through the question and answer section at the bottom of the screen, or you can send them through the chat feature. We'll be answering them towards the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. And Dr. Fricke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I just first want to thank VES uh, Artex for inviting me to this seminar. It sounds like you guys have had many seminars so far, and I'm, I'm looking forward to this particular webinar. Um, I'm going to be presenting optimizing use of sex semen in uh, dairy herds. Again, my name is Paul Fricke. I'm a professor of dairy science in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a background on sex semen. Um, and then I want to go through one of the first studies that we've done with sex semen. This is a cow study to, uh, it's the effect of timing of induction of ovulation relative to time to AI using sex semen on pregnancy outcomes in first lactation Holstein cows. And then I'm going to go through um, a heifer study that we just completed and we're working on uh, getting published. And it's titled Fertility of Holstein Heifers Inseminated with Sex Semen After Five-Day or Six-Day Cedar Sink Protocols or Once Daily Detection of Estrus After Treatment with prostaglandin F2 alpha. So to kick things off, we're going to start with a poll question. And um, here's the question. How long have you worked in the dairy industry? And so the answers are zero to five years, six to 10 years, 11 to 15 years, 16 to 20 years, or more than 20 years. So I'll give you guys a second or two to answer that. Karen, can you see the accumulated tallies on this? Right now, um, it is moving very quickly, <laughs> but oh, it looks good. like um, we've got about 37% have zero to five years. And then we also have 37% with um, more than 20. Wow. So, so we've got kind of a bite. We got a bifurcated <laughs> group. We got the really young people and we've got the... Uh, I won't call them old because I would be a member of that later group. People that have got a lot more experience. How about we'll say that? Yeah, I think you can go ahead and close it down anytime now. And I think it'll give us the results. Oh, you just read off the results. Okay, so for those of you that haven't been around uh, for more than 20 years, um, I just wanna try to give you appreciation for how much reproduction uh, has actually changed in our industry. This is a graph that I used to show a lot in my talks. This is from 1998, of course, over 20 years ago now. And this was one of the first looks at what was the 21-day pregnancy rate on farms in the United States. This happens to be a data set from Minnesota. And so the height of the bars is the number of herds. And on the x-axis is the 21-day pregnancy rate. And you can see that this is a fairly normal distribution. The average of this distribution was 14%, if you can imagine that. So think back to that particular time. Average pregnancy rates back in 1998 were only 14%. And at that time, 20% was kind of the, the goal. It was kind of the pie in the sky. If we can have 20% annualized 21-day pregnancy rate, you were doing very well. And so you can see there are not many herds in this distribution uh, that could do that. And what happened in the intervening years, which is kind of a separate talk in and of itself, is that we've been able as an industry to really move this uh, pregnancy rate to the right. And so to compare that, I'm gonna show you a US 21 day pregnancy rates. This is a different data set. This is from um, uh, DRMS. So over 7,000 DRMS herds, one point, almost 1 1.8 million Holstein dairy cows. And you can see the distribution. Again, same thing here, number of herds on the Y axis. And then on the X axis is the 21 day pregnancy rate little bit more right skewed maybe than the last graph. Average 21 day pregnancy rate is 21.6%. And here's 20. And so you can see now 20 is an old goal. I would say if you're at 20, uh, you need to probably be better than that now. Now our good herds are between 25 and 35%. 
And we even see some of these herds on the very, very um, right uh, tail of this particular distribution with very high pregnancy rates. <clears throat> so over 60% of the herds in this distribution had a 21 day pregnancy rate now uh, greater than 20%. So this has dramatically changed. So the question is what happened? And I think that there's a couple of things that happened in this time period. First, uh, during this time period at the University of Wisconsin, we've been working and others have as well, uh, development and adoption of fertility programs. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, double OVSYNC, for example, for first breeding, resync strategies, so on and so forth. But there's other technologies as well. There's a lot of these automated technologies for detection of increased physical activity associated with, associated with estrus. These systems have been adopted rapidly and widely throughout the dairy industry. And I think they've really helped us uh, with our repro. But the point is that increased reproductive performance led to excessive heifer inventories. And what I saw in the industry is that when people raised too many heifers, the price of heifers went down. And of course the heifers are worth less uh, than it costs to raise them. So people were holding on to their heifers. They were pushing them through herds. We saw first lactation percentage uh, in the herd go really high. But now what we're seeing is some inventory management strategies that have really taken place. So I'm just showing you another kind of normal distribution here. And this would just be say genetic merit on the x-axis. So the poorer genetic animals on the left, the better genetic animals on the right. And whether this is the lactating herd or the non-lactating replacement heifers, what a lot of uh, folks are doing now is they're culling these bottom animals. They don't even raise them if they're heifers. The top end animals they're inseminating with sex semen, which we wouldn't have really thought about in, in our lactating dairy cows even five years ago because, because conception rates were low. And then this middle group of animals inseminating uh, with, with beef semen. And so here's poll question number two. Um, oh, I don't think I can run this when you, oh, there we go. What percentage, I can move this. What percentage of your lactating dairy cows are inseminated with sex semen? For, so for those of you that are farmers in the audience, just go ahead. There's just four answers, zero to 10%, 11 to 25, 26 to 50 or, or more than 50%. So this is lactating cows, not heifers. We're gonna talk about heifers in just a minute. I think we'll just give it another couple of seconds here for people to put their answers Good. in. Thank you very much. So, and if you can read off what the answers are whenever you're ready, because I'm interested in this. So right now, out of 59% of people who have voted so far, we've got 42% who say zero to 10%. That may be because we have a lot of industry professionals on. Yep, uh, yep. Outside of that, we've got 26% at 11% to 25%, and 20. 1% are saying 26 to 50, and only 11% are saying more than 50. Great, thank you. So yeah, that squares with what we have uh, seen in the industry. And I'm gonna show you a couple of graphs next. This, these are graphs my graduate student put together, um, and they're from ag source data from 2020. And so on the X axis, these are stacked bar graphs. We have year starting in 2006. Why 2006? Well, that was the year that sex semen really kind of started to be commercialized in the United States. And then you can see the color of the bars. Red is Holstein conventional semen. The blue is beef conventional semen. And the red is Holstein sex semen. These are insemination in Holstein females. We couldn't separate cows from, from heifers in this data set. So it's all Holstein females. But if you just scan across this, you can see that sex semen hit the market. It was used in kind of a small percentage of Holstein females. But you can see on this graph, something started to happen in 2016. And I would argue that what happened in 2016 is repro started to get really good in our herds. And the problem that I talked about with heifer inventory management started to happen. And people said, we've got to start doing something to get control of our heifer inventories. So more and more sex semen has been uh, used across this time, 21%. Uh, sex semen in Holstein females, 27% beef semen. We just didn't see beef semen used on Holsteins before about 20, I don't know, 2017, 2018. And so this dynamic is happening, happening very quickly. It, it shifted very quickly. And I would say that we're working with farms now that are no longer using Holstein conventional semen. They're just at about 50% sex semen and about 50% 
Holstein. And so that's the Holstein side. This is the Jersey side. Uh, Jersey folks have been using sex semen longer than Holstein folks have, just simply because Jersey bull calves are not worth a lot. And they never have been. And so you can see again, though, the graph reflects that in about 2015, these strategies started being implemented. Jerseys are just using more, 46% sex semen, 34% beef semen. Again, the graph is striking as you move from left to right, how quickly this is happening in our industry. So now we've got poll question number three. And I think this is an interesting one. I, li I like to get, get people's uh, attitude on this. So this is a statement, a true or false question. Advances in semen sexing technology have allowed for similar fertility of sex semen to conventional semen in our dairy herds. Is that a true statement or is that a false statement? And so I don't know about you guys, but when I was in school, I, I liked true and false questions because it was, you know, I got a 50-50 shot uh, on, on this one here. Just give it a few more seconds. So right now we're sitting at about 68% of people saying true. Okay, 68% true and that's typical. Um, I'm gonna argue against the true answer and I'm gonna argue for the false answer. I'm not saying that there haven't been advances in sex semen technology, but they're not, uh, breedings to sex semen are not similar to the fertility of sex semen. That's something that I think a lot of people believe. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go through. Uh, my talk here. So why would that be? Well, there's really two companies that are, are in the sexing market in the United States. Sexing Technologies, the long-standing player uh, in the sex semen market, by, by far the biggest uh, slice of that particular pie. Uh, Sexcell, which is an ABS product, has come on the market as well. And, and uh, they do have some uh, quite a bit of sales as well. And so we separate sperm based on a difference in DNA content between the X bearing chromosome and the Y bearing chromosome. It's about 4% more in the X uh, chromosome. Uh, sperm are stained with a dye and this dye binds to DNA and then they're, they're hit with a laser beam to read them. So, and they're pushed through these uh, systems at high pressure. Um, the systems are a little bit different. This would be the sexing technologies uh, system. And so many sperm are damaged or wasted and we have a different population of sperm. And so I'll go through uh, some of the older data and some people have brought my attention to this. This is clear back in 2008. And this was a large study looking at Holstein heifers inseminated with conventional or sex sorted semen, the product they had back in 2008. And this data would show between about 80 and 85%, you'll get 80 to 85% of the fertility of conventional semen when you use sex sorted semen. And what I want to point out, and something that people don't consider, this is a randomized controlled study, okay? So when you randomize animals to get either conventional or sex sorted semen, we still see this reduction in fertility. I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. It is what it is, but sex semen is more expensive than conventional semen, and we want to maximize use uh, of sex semen uh, in dairy herds. And again, I'll talk about this a little bit as we, as we go through the talk here. So I wanna talk about kind of a big idea that's going on in the industry right now. There's two studies that came out that looked at Jersey cows, lactating Jersey cows that had heat detection systems, these activity monitoring systems uh, being used on them. And these were observational studies. And what they did is they were trying to figure out when is the optimal time to breed a cow based on sex semen? Is it different maybe than, than it would be with conventional semen? Both of these studies suggested that inseminating a little bit later relative to this onset of activity yielded increased fertility with sex semen. And we've done a number of studies. Uh, this is one of the studies that we did with an electronic uh, activity monitoring system. And one of the things that we noted is that when a cow increases her activity associated with estrus, there's a lot of variation among cows in when they ovulate. In other words, it isn't a great predictor of when to exactly breed a cow at the right time, this increase in activity. It has to do with biological variation among animals. We also think it has to do with milk production. And you can see there's variation here too. The, the, uh, the interval from onset of activity to ovulation is on the y-axis here. And this is duration of activity on the x-axis. And so as uh, act, onset of activity to ovulation increases, we see an increased uh, duration of activity too. 
So there's some interesting things going on here, but here's the current idea. And that is this, this idea that inseminating later relative to the onset of activity or estrus will lead to increased fertility with sex semen. Why would that be the case? The thought is that the sexing process or the sorting process causes a sperm to capacitate. Now, capacitation is a process that normally happens in the female reproductive tract. And you need time, it's a biological change that happens in the sperm head that allows it to penetrate the oocyte. And so the thought is that the sexing process initiates this earlier. So breeding later or closer to the time of ovulation might be better for fertility. Now I'm gonna argue that that may be the case if you inseminate cows based on estrus or activity, based on the data from those previous studies uh, that I showed you. But we wanted to test this hypothesis a little more specifically and it really hadn't been tested in a synchronized breeding protocol in which timing of ovulation is precisely controlled. So we're gonna ask the question, can we change the timing of ovulation, not relative to onset of activity, which is variable among cows to the time of ovulation, but now in a situation where we can precisely control uh, the timing of ovulation. And this is the first paper that we published uh, last year. And, um, this is my graduate student, Megan Lager, Lauber, who is uh, working on these particular studies. And here's our hypothesis. We wanted to induce ovulation a little bit earlier within a synchronization protocol, this double off-sync protocol. And we thought that, that breeding later or closer to the time of ovulation would result in more pregnancies for artificial insemination. So this particular project uh, was done in collaboration with ABS. So this was all using the Sexel product. We did this on three different farms, one in Nebraska, one in Ohio, and one in Wisconsin. We only included first lactation cows in the study because that's where these farms were using their uh, sex semen. So we had a total of 730 cows across those three sites. And all cows were using a double off-sync protocol for timed AI in their particular herds. And this is, this is a common way that, that farms are, are managing first breeding. You can see the size of the farms here, and you can see their milk production in kilograms uh, here, the rolling herd average or the ME305. And so these are very good farms, very typical of farms that we see kind of uh, here in the Midwest. So what we did is we randomized cows to two different treatments. This is what we would call a standard double OVSYNC protocol. Here you can see the first OVSYNC protocol. You can see the second OVSYNC protocol here. These studies included the second prostaglandin treatment. And what we have recommended for a very long time with conventional semen is that you give this GNRH, the last GNRH treatment in the afternoon, and that we come back the next morning and do the timed insemination. That gives us an interval from this last GNRH treatment to timed insemination of 16 hours. We know that they ovulate at 24 to 32 hours. And so breeding at 16 hours is breeding before ovulation which gives about eight hours for sperm transport and capacitation in the female reproductive tract. This works really well with conventional semen. So we did this with sex semen. This was one of our treatments. Now to test our hypothesis that breeding close to the time of ovulation would be better, we modified this double OVSYNC protocol to give this last GNRH treatment in the morning. So we simply move this to the morning. And what that does is gives us an interval from GNRH to timed AI at 24 hours now. So now what we're doing is we're breeding the cows about the time they're gonna ovulate. So this is the way we kind of did this. Uh, we didn't move the timed insemination, we moved the GNRH treatment. And the reason we did that, it's easier to move the GNRH treatment than it is to move the timed insemination. Otherwise you have to have breeders come out uh, to, these, uh, to these large farms uh, two different times during the same day. And that wasn't something that they were willing to do. So here are the results. They're very simple, very straightforward. This is the pregnancy check at 34 days. This is the pregnancy recheck at 80 days. The blue bars are the standard interval from GNRH to timed AI of 16 hours. The red bars are the modified protocol where we bred closer to the time of ovulation, the 24 hour interval. And you can see contrary to our hypothesis, we actually decrease fertility. Now this decrease in fertility, uh, I'll just mention this. Um, it could have been due to the timing of insemination, but because we modified the protocol itself, there's other things that we changed. Just for example, the size of the ovulatory follicle and the size of the resulting CL. Nonetheless, the modification that we tested 
had a negative impact on fertility. Uh, fetal sex that was established on two of the farms in this study, 92% and 90% in these two treatments. Those are not statistically different. And just, just to show you that uh, the sexing technology works really well. That's about what we expect is about 90% uh, female, uh, female fetuses. Okay, so just to summarize this first study, if you're using a uh, double off-sync protocol in your first, lactin Holstein, first lactation Holsteins and you're using sex semen, we recommend a standard double off-sync protocol. Again, all these treatments are given in the morning and then you move that GnRH, the last GnRH to the afternoon, and then you breed the next morning. Just real quickly, I'm gonna show you and uh, come back and make a couple of points. Uh, this is a researcher in Ireland, Stephen Butler. I did a sabbatical in Ireland in, in 2014 with Dr. Butler. And he's done a very nice study that they just have published. This is in Irish Frisian Holsteins. They're quite a bit different than our North American Holsteins. They give, give quite a bit less milk, but their fat and protein are much higher. Uh, they use some different kinds of protocols that would be typical for a grazing-based dairy. So these are animals managed in a grazing-based dairy. And what they did, so they did a synchronization program like we did, but rather than moving this last GnRH, they uh, either inseminated at the recommended time for conventional semen or at the uh, modified time. So what they're doing here is actually breeding a little bit later. And the results of their study are as follows. Now it's very nice because they had a conventional semen control. Notice that with conventional semen, 61% conception rate. Now that sounds high for lactating dairy cows, but that's typical in these, in these Irish Frisians. They have very high fertility, 61%. So you can see the first point is that here's the sex semen 16 hour group and the sex semen 22 hour group, 80 to 84% of the fertility of conventional semen. Just like I said, every study that's come out lately looking at sex semen versus conventional semen in a randomized, randomized controlled study comes up with this 80 to 84% of the fertility of conventional semen. Also note, delayed breeding, while in their study it didn't decrease fertility, it didn't improve it either. And so, you know, breeding at the right, at the, at the standard time it is fine in these lactating dairy cows. Okay, so let's talk about heifers. Heifers are some of my favorite, uh, favorite things to work with. And so you can see these heifers here. Poll question number four. Are we ready? Let's see, I gotta click off of that. All right, what percentage of your non-lactating heifers now are inseminated with sex semen? So not lactating dairy cows, but now we're talking about non-lactating heifers. Zero to 10%, 11 to 25%, 26 to 50% or more than 50%. And this should be interesting as well to see what's happening. <laughs> Just give it a few more seconds. In the lead, it would seem that 64% are saying more than 50%. All right. So that is very typical. Um, traditionally, and in fact, when sex semen was first uh, released to the industry, they recommended it only for the non-lactating heifers. Using sex semen and lactating dairy cows is something that's happened within the last five years. So we've got a lot more experience breeding heifers uh, with uh, sex semen. So here's what I want to talk about with these heifers. I want to talk about the fertility he of heifers to conventional semen. Sometimes this is, is something that I think people have a little bit of an idea that heifer fertility is actually higher than it is. Um, optimal time to eye protocol for heifers. This is important to interpret the study I'm going to show you. Um, delaying cedar insert removal. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll get into this particular study that we, that we did. So first, let's talk about fertility of the Holstein heifer population. I like this study, it's back in 2006. So the data uh, was collected before sex semen was released to the industry. So it's not confounded with semen type. This would all be done with conventional semen. You can see there's over half a million inseminations, over 350,000 heifers in over 2,500 herds. And you can see again, this nice normal distribution of conception rates. The most frequent conception rate is 50 to 60%, and the average conception rate is 57%. Okay. 
And this is an interesting number because when I talk to certain groups, if I ask them what they think their heifers should be doing, they say 75% or something. Yeah, well, there's a few herds that can get that high, maybe for a period of time, but average conception rates in non-lactating heifers are right around that 60% range. So important to establish what, what fertility actually is. This group in Florida did, has done a nice job working with these different timed AI pro programs and heifers. And the bottom line here is that this bottom program is the one that has been optimized. It's a modified OBSYNC protocol where we're giving GNRH, we're using progesterone, so we put a cedar in at, at the GNRH uh, treatment. We pull it five days later at the first prostaglandin. We give a second prostaglandin 24 hours later. And then two days later, we give GNRH and breed these heifers. And you can see it's the superior treatment compared to the other two programs. And it's right at the average fertility of uh, heifers bred to estrus, as I showed you in that previous graph. So we've got a very nice protocol here. It's not perfect, but we get about the same fertility as we would get in, um, in an estrus type of a breeding. So this gets to the second study. This is, the se this is Megan again. This is her second project that was uh, in her master's thesis. It's entitled Fertility of Holstein Heifers Inseminated with Sex Semen After Submission to a Five-Day or Six-Day Cedar Sink Protocols or Once Daily Detection of Estrus After Treatment with Prostaglandin F2-alpha. So this was done. These are uh, done on commercial farms, uh, three different farms here in South Central Wisconsin. We're going to call this forever the pandemic trial because we got this trial started right uh, probably in February, I'm guessing, uh, right before the pandemic hit. So we're lucky we got it started and everything set up. And then we were able to basically do this trial uh, during the pandemic. And uh, this was all done with Virgin Holstein heifers. There's a total of 828 heifers and across those three farms. Um, once daily detection of estrus with tail chalk was the way that the heifers were bred in the estrus group. That's how they were managing pretty much on these different farms. And so you can see farm A, farm B, farm C. You can see the ME305 of these particular farms, uh, the number of cows. So these are very typical farms that we have here in, 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 uh, in southern Wisconsin. Very nice farms to work with. And we're always very thankful for the farms that are willing to collaborate with us on these trials. So here's what we did on each farm. We randomized heifers to three different treatments. And the first treatment was very simple. We said on day zero, so we're gonna say day zero is the day that we wanna start breeding heifers. Whatever the criterion is to breed the heifers, that's, that's day zero. We're gonna give them a treatment of prostaglandin F2-alpha. We think that's very representative of reproductive management currently of many heifer growers and many people that are dealing with heifers. You give them this treatment of prostaglandin, Many of the heifers will show a heat, so you get them into the, uh, into the breeding cycle very early uh, when you start uh, wanting to breed them. So this is, think of this as our control group. Then we had this kind of um, good five-day cedar sink protocol. This would be the recommended protocol to use with conventional semen. It is just as I showed you before, GnRH and prostaglandin with the cedar, uh, 24 hours later prostaglandin, and then we do co-sinks in these, in these heifer programs. And then we had an idea, and I'm not gonna show you the previous study. Um, we modified this five-day protocol. One of the issues with these protocols is a lot of heifers will show heat here on day one. And so that's typical of this kind of a protocol. About 30% of the heifers will come into heat. You have to breed those heifers uh, if they do come into heat. So it's not a pure time to eye protocol. We thought if we left that cedar device in an extra day and pulled it at the second prostaglandin, that it would suppress early estrus and turn this into a time to eye protocol. And the study that I'm not showing you is, is one in which that in fact worked with conventional semen. We got similar fertility to these two protocols with conventional semen, and we were able to uh, basically abolish this early estrus problem uh, in this particular treatment. So we said, okay, we've got a pretty good idea here. Let's test that hypothesis with sex semen. So here's the just demographics of the heifers, about 250 per treatment. Here's the five-day group, the six-day cedar group, and the estrus detection of the control group. You can see the weight of the heifers, very consistent across treatments, and the age of the heifers, very consistent 
across the treatment. So very typical, we would see of kind of the dynamics that we would see of heifer growers here in, in Wisconsin. So the first thing we wanna look at is one of the things we were interested in, what percentage of these heifers had this early estrus problem, okay? In the five-day cedar treatment, just as we've expected, just as everyone has seen and published, about 28% of them showed heat on that day one that I showed you, okay? Very typical, you gotta breed those heifers. In the six-day cedar group, that went away. I think there was only one heifer that showed heat, 0.004% of these heifers. And so we were able to do what we thought we could do, which is decrease uh, estrus expression. However, when we looked at fertility, what we saw is that the five-day cedar group had 52% conception rates. Six-day cedar group was not equivalent like it was with conventional semen. It was down to 45%. And the estrus detection group was down to 45%. So these are interesting results. We don't want to use a six-day cedar protocol as I showed you with sex semen in heifers. If you're using sex semen in heifers and you want to do a timed AI program, you're gonna to wanna to use this five-day cedar sink program. A comment here on the conception rates. 52% is about 85% of what we would expect to be normal fertility, which would be 60. So this is very typical fertility that we would see with sex semen in our non-lactating heifers. These numbers are a little bit lower than that, probably because things aren't quite optimized with the timing of insemination in this group. And I would say that's probably uh, the, uh, what's happening in this particular treatment here as well. And I should just notice, this is the second preg check. This is the latest preg check at uh, 64 days. So there was a treatment, significant treatment effect with this treatment, this five-day cedar being better than either the six-day or the estrus detection group. Now. Another thing that we did, because we're interested in the physiology here, what Megan did is she broke out the third of the heifers. So we had 184 heifers that made it to the time to eye. In other words, they did not show heat during the protocol. But remember, we got about 28% of the heifers that do show heat, 71 of them. And so we looked at the conception rates, split that out within this group. And you can see very interestingly, 48% for the heifers that didn't show heat that got to the time to eye, those heifers that came in early, had very high fertility. And this is interesting to us because this is fertility with sex semen in a subpopulation of heifers. And we think that if 28% uh, if of the heifers can have that high fertility, maybe if we could uh, perfect these protocols, we could get the fertility of uh, these, uh, these heifers with sex semen even a little bit higher. So that's just interesting uh, to us uh, as far as the biology that we're uh, looking at. And then the other thing that uh, Megan looked at here is uh, these are heifers that were in asterisk. This is based on rub tail chalk when they received their, the day they received their time dissemination. So this was just based on tail chalk. Did they have rub tail chalk or did they not have rub tail chalk? And what we see here is consistent with what else has been published in the scientific literature. And that is that heifers that show an asterisk about the time you breed them have higher fertility than heifers that don't. That was consistent across all three uh, or both of these treatments. And when you look at this uh, overall. And so the reason for this is that the heifers that don't show heat, you're probably concentrating most of the non-synchronized heifers uh, into this group. And it could be that showing estrus is a good thing for things like sperm transport and, and those kind of things as, as well. So I think this shows that we, we have some work to do with these heifer protocols. They're pretty good right now, uh, but maybe there's some things that we could improve about them. A couple other analyses that, that Megan did that we, we do with these kinds of trials, this is called a survival analysis. And so if I set up the graph here on the, on the y-axis is the, is the proportion of heifers that are not inseminated. So it's kind of backwards way of thinking. So no heifers are inseminated when you start, when you get to day zero, which is when we want to try to breed these heifers, you can see in the five-day cedar group, which is blue, you get this 28% that you breed on day one, and then the rest of them all get their time insemination. In the six-day group, they're all timed inseminated at this particular time on day two. And then in the estrus detection group, remember, we're giving them prostaglandin on day zero. So you get a, a whole group of those heifers that respond to that prostaglandin and come into heat relatively quickly. 
And then these heifers start to tail off. And so when you look at average days to first AI, you can see that it's about two in our uh, timed AI groups. And that's the benefit of using timed AI, right? So we're, we're able to get semen into the heifers right at the end of, I would call this their voluntary waiting period. As, con as opposed to waiting for the heifers to come into estrus, and we're not completely waiting because we're even giving them prostaglandin, but it's about a half of an estrus cycle, about 10 days. So days to first AI lower in the cedar treatments than it was in the estrus detection group. And then this is a graph, a survival curve that looks at days to conception. Again, none of the heifers are pregnant when we start. And then here's day zero of our treatments. You can see um, in the five big group, here's a bunch of those heifers bred to estrus that got pregnant, and then boom, you get the rest of them to get pregnant. And so the difference here in the drop is that difference in conception rate, a lower conception rate for the six-day cedar treatment compared to the five-day cedar treatment. And then of course, these heifers inseminated to estrus are just gonna kind of tail off. Again, when you look at days to conception, there's a significant difference, about 17 and 19 days in the cedar uh, timed AI treatments, and 27 days in the estrus detection treatment. And so to finish this off, um, Megan did a very nice analysis and we felt that this was really important to put this into the context of the economics of these different uh, strategies. And so what she did was a partial budget analysis. And so she included things, now these are the costs on the farms. So she went to these three farms and basically tallied up what are the costs of, of these farms. So we didn't estimate these costs, these were actual costs. And if you look at the cost for hormonal treatments in the estrus detection group, all you have is prostaglandin. So this is cost per pregnancy. Okay, so you have a little cost for prostaglandin. Of course, cedar sink treatments are, are a lot more expensive. You can see that these two treatments are almost, you know, 22 and 21 dollars compared to that. So you got a lot more invested. And I think that uh, many people uh, who, you know, raise heifers, they, they see this upfront cost, right? So it's really expensive. And I hear people saying that, wow, it's too expensive to maybe use these cedar sink treatments in heifers. Look at the cost for detection of estrus. Of course, you have to do that in, in all the heifers and all these treatments, so not much difference there. Cost of semen and AI, right around $70 per pregnancy. Of course, that's the cost of sex semen and the, and the, and the arm charge to breed the heifers. Uh, pregnancy diagnosis, there's going to be a cost for that. And then here's the, here's the real thing that we need to talk about. The thing that is really important to think about with heifers is that days on feed is the biggest cost. I think 50% of the cost of raising heifers are feed costs. And the thing that determines days on feed is when the heifers get pregnant. And so if you look at the cost per pregnancy, the feed cost, it's $82 in the estrus detection group because they got pregnant later as compared to the cedar five group and the cedar six group in which it was $50 and $56. So if you add up this total cost per pregnancy, you can see the calculations here. In the five-day cedar treatment, it was $153.26. In the uh, six-day cedar, or in, excuse me, in the estrus detection group, it was 169. So if we do the math, it costs $16 more per total cost uh, per pregnancy in this estrus detection group as compared to this group, the cedar five group, which performed uh, really well. And so despite this higher upfront cost, the, the feed cost that you save just kind of overwhelm that cost. And so Megan put together this very nice graph. We did a, sense in, a what we call a sensitivity analysis with feed costs. We did this because not everybody has the same feed costs and because feed costs uh, and dollars per heifer per day um, vary from regions of the country and so on and so forth. And so I just wanna pay attention to this blue bar. This is the math that I showed you before. It's the estrus detection group versus that five day group. Uh, you can see by the time we get to a dollar fifty. Uh, in costs in dollars uh, per heifer per day. Um, it's significantly better here for the uh, more, excuse me, for the for the estrus detection. So you're looking at the increased cost associated with not doing uh, the five-day cedar sink program. As these costs went up, that difference got even higher. And so the economics of the system, I think, are such that I think we're going to see people thinking a little bit about how to 
how to optimize uh, the management of their heifers. We have good repro management programs with all of the sex semen that's being used. I think we can do a nice job uh, with our heifers. So here's my take home messages as I wind up here. Uh, for lactating dairy cows, what did we find? Use of standard timing of AI when inseminating permiferous Holstein cows with sex semen after a double offsing protocol. So you don't want to change anything. I would add that if you're, and I think this question might come up, if you're using a heat detection system, uh, I think that you're going to have a, a lower conception rate because there's more variation. Uh, but if anything, you might want to think about breeding a little bit later based on some of the studies that, that are out there. And then with these non-lactating heifers, submission of heifers to a five-day cedar sink protocol for first-time AI when using sex semen, increased fertility, and decreased total days on feed compared with heifers detected in esters after treatment with prostaglandin and F2 alpha for, for first AI. So this five-day cedar sink protocol is a nice strategy to use to really force the issue with your heifers. And so just as I wind up here, I just want to acknowledge a few things. We always have to acknowledge these farms that we work with. We're very thankful to them for uh, willing their willingness to work with us on these trials. We just can't thank those, them enough. So Wet has provided us the hormonal products, ABS Global for their technical services, um, Lodi Veterinary Care and Wanakee Veterinary Clinic. They worked with us, the veterinarians at those two uh, clinics worked with us because they were taking care of the farms and they were great to work with. Belly Egg Software providing for uh, our Dairy Comp 305 software. And then this was uh, supported by a, a grant uh, that we got uh, from ABS Global and, and my Hatch project. And actually the heifer study was also um, funded off of a USDA grant that Megan and I wrote at the outset of the pandemic and got funded. So again, uh, my name is Dr. Paul Fricke. I'm a professor of dairy science in the Department of Animal and Dairy Sciences at UW-Madison. Uh, that's our beautiful campus. We're back to pretty much normal now uh, this summer and we're looking forward to inviting the students back this fall. Uh, to start classes. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and go to this slide and I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Karen and Annie and see uh, if anybody has any questions on anything that I covered today. Well, thank you very much. We do have a number of questions. Some of these came in from our registration page as well. So I haven't included a number of them because you covered them already. You were very thorough. Okay. Um, a couple that came through were, uh, has the effect of beef semen usage on transitioning uh, cows been studied? That's a great question. Um, so the use of beef semen on dairy is a relatively new thing. I get a lot of questions about that. I get a lot of questions about the fertility of uh, beef semen versus conventional Holstein semen or, or versus sex Holstein semen. We don't actually know the answer to those questions because it's hard to do those randomized controlled trials. But I think the question that you're asked, and you're asking is whether it's affecting the transition of the cows that are calving a crossbred uh, beef animal. Is that that kind of the gist of the question? I think so. Yeah, I don't think that there'd be any any influence at all. In fact, if you're using an Angus sire on a Holstein, you're probably going to eliminate most calving problems. Uh, some people are using kind of the the uh, uh, you know, some of the Simmental mixes or maybe even some Wagyu and those kinds of things. I think if anything, you're probably going to be better. You're going to eliminate problems with, uh, with dystocia and those kinds of things just because of the smaller, smaller calf size. So I'm not aware that there's any negative impacts uh, that way. And of course, the reason people are using beef semen is because um, the value of Holstein bull calves has uh, decreased quite a bit. It's bounced around a little bit lately as I've, as I've watched it. Um, a lot of Places here in Wisconsin won't take Holstein steers anymore because they're interested in uh, certified Angus beef. And so I don't think the value of a Holstein bull calf is coming back. And so that's why people are using these strategies. And I've, I've heard people, and, and it depends on how they, they market their animals, but um, uh, they make more money on a crossbred uh, Holstein beef cross animal than they, than they would with, uh, with a straight bred Holstein. So why is sex semen originally recommended for not only or for use only in non-lactating dairy heifers? Great question. Um, and I think I kind of mentioned this a little bit. When sex semen first came out, in fact, another thing that they recommended was you should never use sex semen uh, on a, a synchronized animal. And so they just wanted it used in, in animals or esters detected. So it was because there weren't good synchronization protocols 
protocols. When you have a new product like this and a lot invested in it, you want it to perform well in the field. Uh, so I would say that's the reason for that. And the reason for the use only in non-lactating heifers is because of that decrease in conception rate that I talked about, 80 to 85 percent. When conception rates in our lactating dairy cows were um, lower, because we didn't have fertility programs, we didn't have this kind of reproduction revolution that I talked about where we've been able to increase 21-day pregnancy rates, so on and so forth, uh, you just couldn't afford to decrease conception rates anymore. I mean, we, we had conception rates in lactating dairy cows that were in the 35 to 40% range. You go 85% of that, and you're just decreasing that. And so the thought was that it wasn't economical to use. Now, we work with herds uh, that are coming off of fertility programs, like a double off-sync program. These first lactation cows can average 60% conception rates on conventional semen. Well, you can use sex semen going from 60%, you'll drop it maybe to 52%, but still you're above 50% in that group of animals. So that's really what's changed with regard to the use of, uh, of sex semen. And now too, all the things with heifer inventories and trying to manage those kinds of things. And so a lot's changed in the last five years and it's, it's really changed quickly. In our chat box, there's a question here from Fabio and I'm wondering if you would be able to read it out for us. Okay, let me, uh, can I see it? It can should I be at the, the top when you're um, sharing. When I'm sharing, okay, let me see, Q&A. Uh, it would be in the chat. I see, oh, in the, oh, I see, okay, in the chat. Let me look up here. Uh, I see the Q&A. Oh, okay. But I don't see the chat. I don't have access to the chat unless I stop my screen share. No worries. So I'm going to attempt to read this out to you. Please forgive me. I don't know how to pronounce the acronym. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so how many points difference would conception rate need to be to justify CIDR5D comparing to EDI? How much of a difference in conception, in points and conception rate would there be to... Or rate would there need to be to justify to justify using the six-day protocol over the five-day protocol i think that's probably the question probably um you know uh megan my grad student would probably be better positioned to answer that at this particular point but um you know i i think that six-day protocol can work pretty well I think the difference that we saw, even with sex semen, there are situations where I might even re recommend that protocol. If heifers are at a fairly remote location and you can only go there at certain specific times, you know, you eliminate the need uh, for that estrus detection. And so it's, it wasn't that big of a difference in, in conception rate, uh, surprisingly. Now, I took the slides out. I didn't think I'd have enough time, but I didn't show you the data from conventional semen. And again, the five-day proto protocol versus that six-day protocol with conventional semen and Holstein heifers, there was no difference in fertility. They were absolutely the same. So we were very excited about that. There are, a lot, there are people out there that are using the six-day protocol very successfully with conventional semen. We wanted to look at that with, um, with that sex semen. And uh, I didn't go through the physiology. What we think is happening, if you leave that cedar in that extra day, you do stop them from coming into estrus early, but you probably delay ovulation a little bit within that protocol. And so the, we think the worst thing you can do with sex semen is breed too early relative to uh, ovulation. We probably forced that problem by using that six day protocol with the sex semen. Interestingly though, with conventional semen, I think you have a longer lifespan in the female reproductive tract. And so it can overcome the fact that you're breeding a little bit earlier. And that's how we've interpreted the biology of, of what's going on uh, with that six day protocol. So I think it's revealed some pretty interesting things with the sex semen versus uh, conventional semen. So I hope I answered that uh, question well enough, Fabio. I probably, I probably didn't from an economic standpoint. But. Um, I think he's got some clarifying uh, sections to his question, but I might send you his email just so that we get some clarity Perfect. he's driving at the moment. Perfect. So the next question that we have is how has age at first breeding affected conception rates for non-lactating on sex semen? That's another great question. It's, it's an interesting question. It's probably another 50 minute talk that I could do. Megan's working on this. Um, I think what has happened in the dairy industry is 
uh, the pendulum swung too far to the left as far as uh, trying to calve these heifers earlier and earlier. And there were there was people talking about how early they were calving their heifers. And uh, what Megan has done is she's taken data from a commercial dairy farm, a pretty large dairy farm, 5,000 lactating cows, and basically did a quartile analysis looking at age versus weight. And so what we found with that data set is that age doesn't matter as much as weight, okay? You want to hit your weight targets. You want to breed them at 55% of mature body weight, and you want them to calve at 85% of mature body weight. And what we found is that uh, about half the heifers uh, were not reaching that target. And if they don't reach that target, their future milk production is lower. Fertility is complex. Okay, so this question has to do with fertility to sex semen. Fertility is um, driven as much by the genetic merit of the animals. And we see some, we wanna do some work with the genomic uh, characteristics of these animals. Um, there was a big difference in this quartile analysis, for example, of the um, daughter pregnancy rate among the groups. And so the heifers that got pregnant earliest um, had the highest uh, daughter pregnancy rate and, and the ones that didn't had the lowest. And so we, we kind of think what happened there is probably all the heifers were getting inseminated a little bit too early, but the really high fertility ones got pregnant too early, which is actually a bad thing for for them because of the, the future milk production. So we have a lot of work to do in this particular area. It's a great question. And, and we hope to have more answers to those questions moving forward. He um, Megan's going through another data set from another large farm that has the genomic data on these heifers. So it's a great question, but that's how I'll answer it for now. Perfect, thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. And I think this is a good way to end, but do you have any key points to improve pregnancy rates in sex semen or with sex semen? Um, it's a good question. And what I would say is, uh, I, I think sex semen is, um, how would I put this? Sex semen is a little bit more, uh, you, you need to be a lot more precise with sex semen about everything. So your semen handling, any of the things that you would think of with regard to conventional semen, semen handling, semen thawing, time from thawing to getting it into the animal, um, breeding at the right time relative to estrus or, or ovulation. All of those things are more important for sex semen than they are with uh, conventional semen. And so uh, this has been shown actually in studies, herds that have the best fertility of their heifers to conventional semen tend to have a little bit of a tighter gap between sex and uh, conventional semen. Herds that have poorer fertility overall have a much bigger gap. And what that tells me is just that attention to detail that I'm talking about. So any of the things that you can think of that are affecting fertility to conventional semen, you have to think about those with sex semen and you just have to be better uh, at all of those things, being really precise with all of that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you for coming out and speaking with us today. I think this has been a really informative webinar. Uh, to everybody who's asked questions, if we weren't able to answer them today, I will put you in contact with Dr. Fricky and you guys can contact or you can communicate back and forth and get the answers that you're looking for. I'd like to invite everybody back uh, next July for our next webinar, which is July 2nd, which is managing seasonal and daily rhythms to maximize milk components. So thank you again, Dr. Fricky. We appreciate you coming out. And thank you to everyone who was joining us today. Thank you for having me.